Today's Uzbekistan is referred to as the golden heart of the ancient Silk Road, a legendary trade route that once linked China with Europe and, at the same time, the centers of Islamic civilization. The capital, Tashkent, was growing too. The city was famous in both Orient and Occident for its scholars, poets and artisans. And even today, its inhabitants are proud of their legacy, which is a combination of Oriental, Russian and Soviet times. And markets are held and trade takes place as in former times. Only their locations have changed. A modern domed building now houses a bazaar. The original oasis became the Stone Town. Everywhere, crafts are a reminder of cultural development. Arabs conquered the territory. Next, Genghis Khan and his horsemen invaded. At the end of the 14th century came Amr Timur. Under the Timurids, the political situation stabilized and Islam flourished. The buildings of the colonial district have been built as in prehistoric times and are inhabited by extended families. The new modern Tashkent boasts wide boulevards and plenty of lush greenery. White stalks that symbolize fertility crown the large entrance arcades to the place of independence. Blossoming flower beds surround various memorials. And artists inhabit the Broadway and the grandiose opera house surprises. In 1953, a Russian Orthodox church was built in neoclassical style. A small amusement park represents an element of change. It's a relaxing atmosphere and no more signs of the huge earthquake that devastated the city in 1966. A large city developed from an oasis. The Silk Road was not a single road. There were different routes and one led through the Fagana Valley. where magnificent weddings are celebrated today. The palace of the Khan of Kokand recalls an era full of splendor and wealth. In the 10th century, this was a resting place on an international trade route that made the Khan and his Khanat extremely powerful. The Friday Mosque was at the heart of the Muslim historical center and with its 80 wooden columns could accommodate several thousand worshippers under the Iwan. There is a small museum. Nabuta Beg, one of the most important Khans, had this madrasa built in classical style as a four Ivan construction in 1796. Within Khan's cemetery, next to the regent's final resting place, were those of various of the city's prominent citizens and their wives.
The mausoleum of Omar Khan and his family attracts many visitors. Margilan is the city of silk. The cocoons of silkworms are boiled in large pots while their threads are decoiled. They are then dyed and woven into fabric. The once closely guarded secret of silk production came here on the Silk Road from China. However, the importance of the caravan routes was not limited to the trading of goods, but also a vibrant cultural exchange. The production of bread became an art form and each baker created his own stamp as a unique, distinctive mark. Its production developed with the flowering of the trade route. Rishtan, too, is situated in the Fagana Valley. The city of Potters is one of the oldest and most important ceramic centers of Central Asia. Formerly, porcelain was manufactured here, and kaolin did not exist, only aluminium oxide. Conversion to Islam took place later, and benefited the city. The valley was fertile and blessed with a good supply of water, and the horses that were bred here were popular merchandise along the Silk Road. Fergana is the administrative center of the region. Russian colonial buildings have transformed the cityscape. And a monument commemorates a great astronomer who invented the nilometer. While visiting the amusement park, one almost forgets the myths of the historical trade route. And that German explorer, Ferdinand von Richthofen, came up with the term Great Silk Road only in 1877. Caravans covered various sections. They traveled to Samarkand, Pearl of the Orient, City of Saints, Paradise of the East, one of the country's oldest and most beautiful cities. Samarkand became integrated within the Persian Empire, was later conquered by Alexander the Great and in the 14th century became the center of the world empire of Amir Timur. Newly introduced Timurid design further enriched the architecture. Colored mosaics of astounding luminosity compete with glazed relief ceramics whose ornamentation is composed of arabesques, font characters and geometrical shapes. The Tilakari Madrasa is the third madrasa on Registan Square. Its interior is extravagantly decorated with gilded reliefs of Kundai technique and the building was used as both a university and Friday mosque. Glazed tiles and decorative effects, mukhanas above the prayer niche, and geometric and epigraphic decorations with quotations from the Quran and the name of Allah symbolize the presence of God. Next door is the Sherdor Madrasa. The symbolism depicted on the monumental magnificent portal testifies to the self-confidence of powerful and radiant rulers. The Madrasa was once a place of knowledge and is now used by merchants and artists who continue to demonstrate their skills here. 
The Registan, with its powerful three madrasas, domes and minarets, is a never-to-be-forgotten sight. Amir Timur progressed from being a mercenary to a brilliant commander and founder of a world empire. The Rukobod Mausoleum was constructed for Sufi Sheikh Sagadshi under Timur's rule. It is said that Timur always dismounted from his horse before passing by the tomb on foot. Nearby is Guri Amir, the grave of the prince, the mausoleum of the once powerful Amir Timur and some of his closest relatives and associates. Nine cenotaphs of precious stone mark the tombs that lie within a crypt below. The Bibi Kaning Mosque became Timur's most prestigious project, the largest and most magnificent Friday mosque of the entire empire, named after his main wife. Opposite is the Bibi Kanim Mausoleum, a brick building with a blue glazed dome. According to tradition, it contains the tombs of Timur's favorite wife, a mother, and three nieces. Although the main room is decorated with fine murals and gilt kufi reliefs, it has not been possible to identify the exact occupants of the tombs. Although the Samarkand's Bazaar now has a new, modern environment, the variety of goods on offer could never have been greater. fresh fruit, vegetables, honey and cheese. The Shahi Zinda Necropolis, a pilgrimage destination, existed long before Timur. Numerous mausoleums line the narrow streets and its interior is quite remarkable. According to legend, it contains the tomb of Qusam ibn Abbas, a cousin of the Prophet Muhammad. Even today, the complex consists of 20 buildings, most of which date back to the 14th century. A place of faith and peace, and also Majolica art at its best. And some complexes of the necropolis are particularly popular destinations of pilgrims. It's tantamount to being an outdoor museum of Timurid architecture, with influences that came to Samarkand from Timur's various conquests. On a hill above the necropolis, is Afro Siab, a pilgrimage site of pre-Islamic times. The Hazrat Hizir Mosque. More than a thousand years old, it features Samarkandian ethnic architecture to commemorate the Islamic saint, eternal pilgrim, and patron of travelers. The Afro Siab Museum contains archaeological finds from the period up to the Arab conquest. Mosaics, carpets, ceramics, coins, and wall paintings from the Sogdian period. 
On Afrasiab Hill, there was once Marakanda, capital of Sogdiana, a prosperous city that was famous in the entire Near and Middle East. Until it was eventually destroyed in the Mongol invasions of the 13th century. In the north, the hill borders the Siab River Valley, a sacred source of life. Situated on a slope lies the tomb of Daniel. It is believed that Amir Timur brought the bones of the prophet here from his Persian campaign. In front of the tomb house is an old tree, full of the wishes of the faithful. On a hill on the outskirts of Ulug Beg is an observatory. Its remains are still spectacular and reminiscent of the astronomical obsession of Amir Timur's wise nephew. Beg attracted famous astronomers to its university, with whom Timur's nephew published the Book of Fixed Stars. Samarkand is a tale of breathtaking beauty, the glamorous face of the earth. Sharizad the birthplace of the great Timur, the riding general, who established a dynasty. Defensive walls secured his city and its gigantic buildings. But only ruins of the huge entrance portal to the White Palace have been preserved. The size of these buildings have exceeded those in its nearby capital, Samarkand. In a semi-nomadic warrior society such as the Timurids, it was customary to have several cities of similar rank. The common translation, White Palace, is actually misleading because it was actually sky blue. Amir Timur began as a leader of a group of adventurers and succeeded in forming an empire of unbelievable cruelty. The Darat Tilawat complex comprises the burial site of Timur's father, a madrasa and the Kok Gumbaz Mosque. Within the mosque, the father of Ulug Beg is also buried. The main portal of the large domed building faces east. The wall and ceiling paintings inside the Kok Gumbaz mosque contain well-preserved floral motifs of Chinese influence. The mirab is decorated accordingly, and geometric and epigraphic decorations frame it discreetly. With colourful tile decorations in which high-fired colours glow on a white background. The remains of a large bare palace wall cover an ornate burial site. Deep below, in a vault that was discovered by chance, is the tomb that Amir Timur had built for himself, but was never used, as he was buried in Samarkand.
corner of the burial site, a 27-meter-high, undecorated dome rises above the Jahangir Mausoleum. From here, an old wooden gate leads to the mosque of Holy Hazrati Imam, who came from Baghdad, or Kashi. The summer and winter mosques are still used today. The Silk Road led through deserts, and caravanserais such as Raboti Malik were the only resting places on the road between oasis towns for both man and beast. Here, a water reservoir was worth more than all the gold in the world. This dates from the time of Karakhanids and belonged to the caravanserai. Further west, the caravans reached the oasis city of Bukhara. God's blessed city on the border of the Kizilkum Desert. In the Middle Ages, it was one of the most important religious and economic centers of the Islamic world. Labi House, a large water basin, is, along with several irrigation canals, fed by the Serashan River. In ancient times, Bukhara belonged to Sogdian and took advantage of the location of the Silk Road. It was a city of poetry, myths and legends, with 350 mosques and more than 100 madrasas. On the outskirts of the ancient town of Chorminor is the madrasa of the Four Minarets. It was built in 1807 by a wealthy Turkman. All sorts of conventional crafts have been handed down and are still used today. Bukharan rag dolls continue to be manufactured and offered for sale. Returning to the center, there's a synagogue. In the middle of the 19th century, 500 Jews lived here. Beneath the domes of ancient bazaars, trade still continues today. The oldest surviving Magoki Atori Mosque is located on the site of what was originally a place of worship for the moon god Sin, and later a Zoroastrian fire temple. Due to its central location on the Silk Road, in pre-Islamic times, Bukhara was an important center of trade. All manner of goods were sold here. A single building is a reminder of the great astronomer Uluq Beg the homonymous madrasa whose first creations most likely appeared in 1417. And opposite is the magnificent Abd al-Aziz Khan madrasa. Where commercial routes met, a dome was built over the crossing. Goods were produced and sold here.
The splendid Paul Kalyan complex is even now a notable city landmark. It contains the Mei Arab Madrasa that is still used as a religious institution and also the famous Kalyan Minar Minaret. From almost 50 meters, the Muezzin overlooks the Kalyan Mosque. The Friday Mosque can accommodate 10,000 worshippers. It was built in the early 16th century, the period of rule of the Shabanids. Following the foundation of the Arab Caliphate in the 7th century, Islam was established. And the Ark Citadel became the castle of the Emir of Bukhara, in which he and his confidants resided. In the Middle Ages, the Citadel was a complete city with a palace, mosque, government buildings, warehouses, a prison, and public gathering place. A small museum contains the throne of the last emir. The residential area outside the old town enjoyed much prosperity. To show off its wealth, the Baland Mosque was built according to Timurid design. Chashma Ayu is a respected pilgrimage destination. When this area was desert, its inhabitants begged God for water. Yob appeared banging a stick on the ground and consequently a fountain miraculously filled with water. The greatest scholars, poets and thinkers lived in Bukhara. Including one of the most famous founders of Sufism who was both born and laid to rest here. Bakhudin Naqshbandi for whom this holy place of pilgrimage in Bukhara was built during its construction period of five centuries. He became a sheikh and also one of the spiritual teachers of the later great Timur. In the free space between the buildings, there are water basins. Pilgrims travel here from far and wide. The motto of the Sufi Brotherhood was the way to God is in mutual relationship with him and not in hermitage. The pre-Mongolian mausoleum of the Samanid rulers is an example of Samanid brick architecture and is also the oldest mausoleum in Central Asia. To the west of the old town is the large Khorus Bakir necropolis, burial place of Abu Bakr and his three brothers, the Sayyids, descendants of the Prophet. On the northern outskirts is the Sitorai Mohi Hosa summer palace of the last Emir of Bukhara. He spent less and less time in the Ark and preferred to relax here in the magnificent ambience of the palace. The spacious park also included the Emir's harem. Until the very end, he craved in vain for the eldest daughter of the Tsar. A water basin in front of the main palace 
makes it appear even larger. The rooms are now used as a museum for tapestries and embroidery. The Silk Road continues through the Kizil Desert and along the Amudaria River. The back of beyond. Construction work in the middle of the desert. Bricks of clay and sand. Within the spurs of the red sand or Kizilkum desert, the remains of many desert fortresses are still to be found today. At first, we visit Kizilkaya, the red fortress. A rectangular castle with walls up to 16 meters high. Here, the external walls are being rebuilt with essentially the same materials that were used originally, creating a very sturdy structure that produces remarkable stability. Three kilometers east of here is the Toprak Kala fortress. It resembles a fortified town and was built on a nine meter high artificial elevation. Its impressive dimensions of 350 by 500 meters provided 2,500 people with long-term shelter. On the highest point, an artificial hill was a palace and temple district that is visible within the remains of the foundation walls. It's believed that this desert castle was built in the first century AD as a temporary residential town for the Shah of Khorezm. But was abandoned in around the fourth century. The wild west of Uzbekistan is a wonderful region of deserts with just a few yurt camps for overnight accommodation. Ayaz Kala is the most important of the desert fortresses. Actually, there are three fortifications, of which the highest is the largest. Measuring 150 by 180 meters, the castle is up to 10 meters high and has two meter thick walls. Directly within the city's ring wall was a second wall with an arch covering the space between. Panoramic views provided the castle with much security. Kirk Kizkala emerges from the middle of the flat, featureless desert. Almost mystically, the final sharp fragments of the castle's former defensive towers emerge from the ground, which consists mainly of gravel and are covered with low saxile bushes that defy the desert's strong winds with their deep-reaching roots. In former times, the Amudaria River flowed more to the east and there were large expanses of fertile alluvial soil with numerous fortified settlements 
that dated back to pre-Islamic times. The region was defended by around 50 desert fortresses, or Kalas. Kurgoshin Kala is also of huge proportions. The Kalas were the fortresses of the independent feudal lords of that time. In antiquity, the two main lifelines of Central Asia met here. Water and the Silk Road. Both had to be protected and defended, thus huge walls were built, with loopholes out of which archers could shoot their arrows. The interior of this palace was so immense that if necessary, even more subjects could gather for shelter in this desert fortress. Kirilgad Nkala is referred to as the Mysterious Fortress, a circular building 90 meters in diameter. Several concentric ring walls frame numerous domed rooms. These structures contained two floors. Today, herds of goats move across the external walls, which were once, it is believed, a royal burial site. However, such places also had to be defended. Therefore, a gallery with loopholes was built for the archers. Huge walls protect the earliest, but also the largest fortress complex of Big Guldusun. Apart from the fortified towers at the front and the 15 meter high external walls, nothing else remains. What we can see today is the superstructure of the original construction that dates back from the 7th to the 8th century. In the 13th century, this fortress, as well as many others, fell victim to the Mongol hordes. Armed with bows and arrows, the nomadic horsemen flew across the steps, destroying everything in their path. This is all that remains of those days. But what is left helps us to appreciate and understand the former greatness of the mighty desert castle. Only salt lakes such as the Kalajik Salt Lake are reminiscent of the once fertile marsh. Also, the Kalajik Kala was a huge lone fortress that protected this area and its inhabitants. An approximately 100 by 200 meter wide site, surrounded by high, low walls, 
and built for the protection of thousands of people. They could flee here if attacks from aggressors took place. Their lord let them enter the desert fortress protected by his soldiers. Also, the merchants and travellers of the Silk Road found refuge here in times of emergency. Romantic notions of caravans on the Silk Road were pure fantasy. Danger lurked everywhere. Huge mountains had to be crossed and vast desert areas traversed, with up to 1,000 camels at a time. At last, we reach the oasis city of Khiva, the eighth wonder of the world. Another destination on the ancient Silk Road. It was here that mathematician Mohammed lived, who, as Al Khorezmi, discovered algebra. Khiva is one of the greatest centers of ancient Khorezm, land of the sun, in the west of today's Uzbekistan. An oriental city in which its greatest minaret, Kalta Minar, remains unfinished. Pohna Ark, fortress of the Khan, is situated within the city walls. The condemned had to wait for their execution at its entrance. The Ark became a city within a city, with various reception courtyards and an elevated circular podium for the Khan's yurt. Even the small throne hall has been preserved its wooden throne covered with fine silver leaf. Adjacent is the harem's courtyard. And small hidden rooms of craftsmen. Of the castle's former towers, only a bastion of pure clay and wood has survived. From here, the enormity of the city walls that totally surround Khiva can be seen. Opposite the fort is one of the city's largest madrasas, whose construction was ordered by Khorezmian Khan Muhammad Rahim. And tightrope acrobatics that first originated in Khiva are performed here even today. The History Museum contains costume jewellery, clothing, and old photographs of the city's strong men. The area of the inner city measures around 30 hectares, and its buildings lie close to the city wall. A mighty wall it is up to 10 meters high and 8 meters thick. The mighty north gate and three further gates in each cardinal direction are the entrances to the fortified historic center, the Ichchan Kala. Both walls and gates provided the city's residents and their guests with good protection. The minaret and Friday mosque were built upon the foundations of the city's earliest 10th century buildings. An archaic mosque design with a low hall whose flat roof is supported by 212 columns.
Some of the wooden pillars come from an ancient mosque of the neighboring town of Kaf, which was washed away by devastating floods. Some columns contain Kufi fonts. A uniquely atmospheric place. Beyond the mosque is the ancient mausoleum of Jewish Sheikh Saeed al and his guard. Unlike the Pahlavon Mahmud mausoleum, this one was originally built in simple form to commemorate the famous 14th century poet. And from the 19th century came the necropolis of the reigning Khan dynasty of Kungrad. It has become a much visited pilgrimage site. The new mausoleum now contains the ancient tomb, and Chanaka, with its high double domes, is quite remarkable. According to medieval architectural tradition, Khiva is divided into two parts, downtown Ichankala and outer town Dichankala, where the city's residents live and work. Almost 1,500 years of Oriental culture are hidden within the intriguing, winding streets of this fine oasis city. Outside the southern gate, the fortress walls contain semicircular towers. And near the eastern gate, numerous domes indicate bathhouses. The well-preserved Eastern Gate is always a hive of activity, as the Grand Bazaar is located just outside the city wall. Various craftsmen offer their services in this area. Among one of the city's madrasas, Kutluk Murodinok is one of the oldest, and the courtyard's fountain is still in use. A small white mosque acts as a connecting link to the nearby madrasa of Alakuli Chan. He had this magnificent madrasa built alongside a large caravanserai. The merchants were impressed. Merchandise is still traded here. Toshhovli, the stone yard, was the main palace of Olokuli Khan, a complex with several courtyards of various sizes. The Mechmong Chona was reserved for official receptions, with numerous columns and majolica walls. The living and sleeping area of the Khan look rather cramped in comparison to the large courtyard and rooms of the harem. The elevated section of the Khan's yurt fills the small courtyard whose walls and diwan are decorated with majolica tiles. Power and progress are depicted here, and from these, a unique style of architecture developed. Mm -hmm. 
Despite its varied history, the mysterious city of Hiva has preserved the exoticism of ancient times and continues to be a traditional Islamic oasis city. The ancient Silk Road eventually became a tourist route, but the magic of its oriental beauty has survived, and its historic monuments enchant even today with the magic of a thousand and one nights and all of the eternal charm of the Orient.